welcome back everyone and uh, we'll continue our video series where we are do going to do the fault isolation or fault uh, classification of the Tennessee Eastman process data set that we have been working on throughout this video series and uh, for this particular video we are going to use neural networks in the past video we saw how you can use different machine learning algorithm and how can you do machine uh, fault classification using uh, sensor data but uh, today we are going to especially use neural network or the deep learning we'll this will be our first step towards deep learning so let's see how we are going to do that first we'll import some library this pi reader is important because the data set we have is in the r r data format so that's one important thing next we'll import our fault free and faulty data will concatenate them which you have been doing throughout this video series if you are confused about this data set i'll link i'll link the another video to the uh, in the description box which you can refer where i have completely described what this data set is where you can download and uh, all the other important part that you may find relevant if you have never come across any video all right so let's move ahead well, after we have concatenated the fault free and faulty data set, we'll get our entire data frame, which consists both fault free and faulty data in it. Fault number zero refers to fault free condition, and there are 20 different faults that has been introduced. From XME1 to the last XMB11, there are 52 different sensors which have been continuously monitoring the process data. But we don't need all this uh, feature in our analysis. So in the next step, I'm going to drop the features which are highly correlated with some other feature. So first I'm going to get the correlation matrix of this data frame. Then I'm going to take the upper triangular matrix because they are symmetric. Then I'm going to drop the columns which have value higher than 90. That means which are correlated with another feature with more than 90% correlation and I'm creating this uh, two drop list which consists of all these variables which have very high correlation this we have analyzed in the first video of this series as well if you want you can look into that where I did the correlation analysis of different features next uh, now I have in this two drop list I have all the name of the features that I would like to drop and next what I'm doing I'm I'm getting a single simulation run of data. So I'm saying, let's say simulation run four. So I'm getting simulation run four for all type of faults and for all samples. Next, I'm dropping the two drop uh, list of uh, features, all these features from the data set. And then I'm neglecting this three fault scenarios. That's all. So finally, my uh, reduced data looks something like this, where we have fault number, simulation run, because I choose simulation on 4, you get only simulation on 4. And for each fault number, we have uh, 500 sample. All right. And then we got all the feature values. Okay. Moving ahead. Next, I'm going to do uh, standardizing my data. For that, I'm creating a mean max scalar and I'm fitting that mean max scalar on my reduced data. This is my reduced data. So here I'm, I'm fitting my mean max scalar. So three from three onwards means I'm creating the features from third feature onwards. So zero, one, two, from here onwards, I'm doing my scaling because this is not necessary. They are just uh, organization of the data set. All right. Next, what I'm doing. So this is this in this step, I'm just scaling the data and, and I'm saving this in this SC, the scalar object or a scalar, scalar in, instance. In this one, I have the minimum and maximum value for each row, each uh, each feature, so that I can scale them later on. The next step, uh, I'm getting the data set from the DF data frame, which consists of both faulty and fault-free data. I'm taking simulation run from one to fifty. All right. Then I'm dropping my uh, the features that are highly correlated. Then I'm removing different three different fault scenarios because they are very similar to the normal fault condition. Then I'm doing uh, features. I'm uh, splitting this reduced data into the feature input and output. For my input is the sensor data and my output is the fault number or the 
class of fault then i because this is uh, uh, this will be 0 1 2 the fault number so i need to convert it into one hot encoded vector so for that i'm importing scikit-learn one hot encoder i'm uh, creating an instance of that then i'm fitting on my uh, target value y this reshaping is necessary just for just for this function nothing else it's nothing special then i'm transforming that including my encoder or my one hot encoding uh, instance on the y value so i get y encoded so if i do this if i write here so now i'm doing training and test split i'm taking 20 percent as my test and rest all are training 345,000 samples like that then it comes the training of the neural network part so i'm using keras functional api first i'm creating the input and dense layer just this two very i'm going to keep it very simple i'm importing the model so my input shape is going to be x train dot shape one so x train dot shape one is 40 because i uh, neglect i dropped the feature which are highly correlated so my shape is going to be like that then i'm putting two dense layer with the S cellu activation, it's just advanced form of ReLU activation that we already know. I'm keeping 100 uh, hidden units, 100 hidden units of another layer. And then I'm just, uh, so that's going to be my final layer, hidden layer. And then in my output, I'm keeping a softmax layer where Y train dot shape one, which basically means 18. I'll have 18 neurons at the out with softmax activation. Then I'm compiling them using categorical cross entropy, Adam optimizer, and my matrices, my matrices are going to be accuracy. If you see the model accuracy, this is how it looks like. Very simple. I have 16,000 parameters to train on. Then I'm training my model. So while training, I'm creating an early stop uh, callback so that it, uh, my model won't overfit too much. And uh, yeah, that's it. And then I'm fitting the model. And if you see, after I, I think I, I only have to do for 45 uh, iterations, 45 epoch. And uh, I can you can see that uh, the here. Yeah, here you can see that uh, this is the training accuracy. They're pretty similar. Like the, the training and validation are very close to each other, which is a good thing. There is no overfitting going on. Next, we need to evaluate our training data. So I'm importing the confusion matrix and the accuracy score. This is a function that we have used previously to plot the confusion matrix. So to get the prediction, what I'm doing, I'm using model.predict on the test data. So this will give me an output which is 18 dimensional. And then I'm using on top of it encoder, which is the one hot encoder of the scikit learn that I have trained before. And then inverse transform so it will take the 18 dimensional feature and it will give me the corresponding output of what which fault it belongs to and then uh, y true will be i can just uh, the whatever y test value i had i can just inverse transform on that and then i can plot using y true and y print and this is how it looks like this you can see that this is way better than other machine learning algorithm and truly uh, truly surpasses all the machine learning algorithm with a simple ne neural network architecture and uh, we get a neural network arc uh, accuracy score of 92% which is excellent compared to the last uh, XGBoost method which was 88% if, uh, if I'm not wrong. All right, now we'll do real time fault prediction where I'm basically iterating through all the fault classes from 0 to 20. I'm importing them in a temporary file df new my x new is basically all the sensor value and then i need to scale the transfer uh, the sensor value using sc in my y pred is the uh, the prediction that i get using the neural network model uh, model is the neural network i already trained on and predicting on the x new this one then I'm taking the inverse transform so it will give me which class exactly it belongs to and y proba gives me the uh, probability of uh, like the probability value of uh, that fault and I'm just plotting them here so if we see here if I go here you see this is this is fault zero 
here you can see the cyan line cyan line represents the true the true value of fault the, the true fault label that is present and the dots or the scatter plot represents the prediction of the neural network you can see that most of the time it lands on the zero line but there are some misclassification though right for fault one we can see most of them lie here and it, it's doing very great for fault two as well for fault three uh, not so good because we already excluded fault three from our data set fault four great fault five also very nice fault six also very nice yeah so you can see like that and after that i want to obtain a single accuracy score for all the fault scenarios so for that i'm obtaining my simulation run from anywhere between 1 to 500 just to get a random idea and i get an average accuracy score of 91 percent which was 77 for the XG boost case even after hyperparameter tuning all right so next let's visualize how the how the performance uh, how our data looks like in a lower dimension in a two dimension before it is stringed and after neural network is stringed. so first what i'm doing is yeah so first what i'm doing is uh, i'm creating the tsni i'm uh, importing the tsni then i'm training that tsni model with the two components so that i can plot it in two dimensional uh, two dimensional plane and i'm fitting on my x train data set i'm re i'm resampling this x train because it takes a lot of time to train and then i'm uh, my label is going to be encode dot inverse transform that means uh, the corresponding label of y train then i'm creating a subplot where i'm using c born scatter plot where my x is going to be the first component the first dimension of the t -SNE, and uh, y is going to be the second dimension and the color represents which type of fault it belongs to all right so let's see here and uh, what does so here we can see the 0 to 20 refers to a different type of fault and you can see that sub faults are different but most of the fault lied together so it's uh, there is no class discriminant they are not uh, away from each other and let's see how it uh, looks after we have trained our model so for that what i'm doing is uh, i'm obtaining keras uh, model so this model uh, so what i'm doing is this model is already trained on this is our trained neural network so i'm splitting i'm taking the last uh, the second last layer i'm removing the classification layer i'm just taking the second last layer so this will be model layer minus uh, layer minus two so this one so this will be my entire uh, network and all this these values are already trained on i'm using the trained network so this uh, these weights are already trained on and then i'm doing the same but right now what i'm doing is uh, this is my intermediate model which i called the intermediate model and i'm predicting using the intermediate model so my output is now a 100 dimensional vector i'm predicting on my x string and uh, next uh, this x inter will be a 100 dimensional uh, 100 dimensional vector and then i'm doing the same tsni on this uh, output or the embedding embedding from from the intermediate intermediate model and i'm then doing the tsni on that rest all is same so now we can see that the different type of faults are grouped together so the machine has learned to classify them somehow like this is an abstract idea i'm reducing them in a two-dimensional plot so this is not a justice in a higher dimension they must be you know they must be separated much better so that's what i wanted to show here uh, so after training all the different type of fault we can see they're way much uh, grouped together compared to before when it was trained so yeah so that was it about this video in the next video we'll see how we can use convolution neural network and lstm model on this particular data set and uh, are we going to achieve better result compared to this or not and how is our uh, tsni plot is going to look like